Somebody gave me an assignment. I think it was. It was either for a book club. It's uh, I, they told me to get a book and read it and present it next year. And I was like, oh, looks like a great book. So why not? So I'm I'm kind of game for that. So. Yeah, it was somebody from church. I'll have to look back and see if it was. It wasn't Carolyn's, although, you know, that's it. Well, it's okay when I'm very into it. Yeah. It was very great. Oh, yeah. It was either Janice Camp or, forget the first name, Wheeler. Jennifer oh, Martha. Margaret. Maybe it was Jane. There, they were like that one. They didn't have any money coming. All right. Good morning. 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 Read something and then be able to discuss it with people. That's kind of my favorite part. Uh -huh. All right. So the little cards on the table. Someone asked if we could make if everybody can make their own um, table tent because they don't know everybody in the group. Name yeah. So just a little table. So just write your name and then just stick it in your book so you can use it each week. Oh, and these are questions for discussion. Actually, he told Sherry to tell you, and I was walking by, and she said you were down here, so I should have said, oh, I'll stop her. <laughs> then these copies were made. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. How are you? Pretty well. I thought you were just at the cafe. I was. But they didn't have the bags. We're going to be two sided. Oh, today, yeah. Oh, we're going to buy a bunch of very That way you can see it. In case you forget, They sell it very far and small and stuff. <laughs> That's the whole idea. I mean, you have a really <laughs> well, high waisted pants just came back. So we'll see if the teenagers picked up on that. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I wonder if it gets recorded. 
Well, I thought so, but then last week, uh, when I joined it, was it the level I felt like Jesus and John Wayne? Right. Even though I couldn't be the first to look at that one. Yeah. Right. Should we should go back and look at the discussion, mm -hmm. but so far I've been seeing it. It's still out there. <laughs> That's good. That was yes, he's great. And it's still not enough at all. This one. 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 Did you find it or no? She had to say, I didn't know they were zooming in because she had several people in the Okay, I don't know. I haven't been reading the I'm sending an email about it right now, so we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Which is getting increasingly difficult. <laughs> 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 Good morning, Bob. Welcome back. Absolutely. Let's put this right here. And then I'll never. Her mother passed away two weeks before she uh, uh, left on June 1st. Not five no, not five uh, July 1st. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and yeah. so, you, you can send her a text about it. some of the places that she is.
Hello, Liv. Your flowers look beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they're really awesome. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. And they're very tall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. They are. I'm glad that came out. They just kept growing vertical. And I thought, man, it was fine. And then I put flowers. You know, Will was a gardener. Will's a gardener. Lips a master gardener. Oh, yeah? You're a gardener? I am. Do you do vegetables, flowers, or butter? Mainly vegetables, but we have flowers. Yeah. Oh, I'm doing our Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, pretty decent sized yard, so we're continuing to grow it. But yeah, we've got pepper that plants just harvested a ton of garlic. Um, onions, um, tons of beans, um, chicken and fish, and tomatoes this year. Yeah, we went, we went crazy. We got a lot of stuff. I just got some out of the room. Okay. Can you hear from our friend? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we 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 are you ever Yeah. Hi, how are y'all? Good, thanks. Good. I'm shuffling kids around this morning, so I'll be in and out of the car. Was there a song about shuffling? Yeah. <laughs> I seem to remember hearing that as my yeah, uh, really children did not like around white writers too. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, we um we do everything to just stay on that and I mean it's cheaper, but I don't think it's quite easy to get better stuff. <laughs> oh, wow. I just didn't um, do it in the but I didn't listen to those who were Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, 
We had some folks who were not here last week who were, um, and we've got some folks who weren't here last week who aren't with us this week, and we've got some folks on Zoom. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Lynn Caldwell, raise your hand, suggested <laughs> that we maybe make little uh, name tag. Uh, Tent name. Tent name. Here, here's a tent. Looks like a tent. It does. Name on it. Experience, Your right? tents are a lot simpler and older than mine. That's all I have to say. Mine actually have sides. So oh. Your tent. Tent name. So you can go ahead and do that. So you know those around you. And you just leave them at the back, and we can leave the quiet. <laughs> we could do that. Or alternatively, you could put it in your book and bring it back with you. But uh, we could do that. Yeah. And the. Uh, the other thing, there's a, a piece of yellow paper on your on your tables. There may not be enough for everybody, um, but uh, Liv suggested that we maybe have some questions to engage a little conversation ahead of time. So I'll wait for a few more people to join us, and then we'll go ahead and uh, make sure you have your tent names. Um, I think I think my tent name pitch or I was gonna say Pullman. Uh, I've been trying to think of Osprey. What brands of tents are there of tent name? Um this is uh professional educator language, not stuff I know. As uh, as folks are settling, just how are you finding the book so far? Engaging. We are just on chapter one, so I'm not expecting all my questions to have been answered. You know, uh, I don't know of many Davidsonians who find all of their questions ever answered. <laughs> so uh, I am grateful for the high bar that you're setting, that this, in fact, might achieve that goal in your lifetime. But uh, but we'll get through it. I am, um, I'm, as I said last week, grateful that you all are willing to read this um, with me. A uh, welcome to uh, the number of you who are new this week. Uh, I should say on the far table, uh, there are copies of the schedule. If you've not get, gotten one of those, you're welcome to pick one of those up. And um, uh, there are copies of books. I assume everybody has a book. and is finding it readable. Uh, anything else for the good of the whole? Rosemary is not with us today. One of the things that the Thursday morning woman's Bible study does is write cards to those who have been in hospital or needing encouragement or something like that. And I believe that we'll continue to do that this summer, but what we've done in the past summers is Rosemary's written a number of cards and left it in the back or on the side table where we all can sign uh, and we remember our folks uh, who need uh, a little encouragement. Stephanie, you might want to uh, talk with Rosemary about that. As well. You got it. Uh, Ann Ridley had a birthday this week. We celebrate that with you. Hope it was a good birthday. <laughs> good. Uh, anything else for the good of the whole? There's an announcement from the Westminster Cafe about the Authors Roundtable, which will be this Friday from 10 a.m. until noon down in the cafe. It is free. Um, the authors that will be there are Jane Lorenzini. Um, her books are After the Rain and the Growing Season. And then another kind of up-and-coming author is 
Samuel Walton Owen. Oh, Sam will be there. Great. Yeah, church member. Yeah. <laughs> as far as I know, he's up and coming. I guess I don't know that. He's <laughs> up and coming. He's an eighty-year-old. Yeah, <laughs> love that. Well, his book is called "Old Times Not Forgotten." Yeah, as told by a son of the South. Oh, that sounds intriguing. Well, interestingly, no. you may not know that he was on the, I believe it was 1963 to 62 undefeated University of Mississippi football team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was overshadowed by the fact that um, 101st Airborne had to be on campus that year. And I remember this all correctly, Robert? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's quite a story. So, good. All right. Uh, go ahead in your tables, uh, greet one another, make sure you know your name, and see if you can talk about that first question. The authors contend our lives have all been shaped by world empires in some way. Um, do you agree? How do you understand empire? And what's the difference between world empires and the kingdom of God? I'm just going to jump into the shallow end. Um, and uh, perhaps, Jolyn, you can join that table and spend just a few minutes talking about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lockheel and Joe and Joanna, I can maybe see if I can put you into a breakout Hey guy. Yeah. It's low peel. I don't need to chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll chat with Joanna if she wants to. <laughs> Let me put you in the room. Oh great. I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you. 
But I'm trying, you know, like initially I didn't know how it would be available. So this this guy's going to have a Well, and so because it impacted your station, Thank you. 
Just take another minute or so, we'll come back together. <laughs> I don't know that I read anything where Good conversation. Let's go on back together if we might. We'll uh, we'll look at the other parts of the the handout a little bit later in class. Um, this is the first time that uh, I've met uh, Michael Bird and leads off the the uh, the chapter and sets his own context uh, about his background. Also mentions a little bit of NT rights, and uh, then on page two he says. The place where I grew up and the vocations I've had were directly related to the rise and fall of more than one empire. Um, and then a little further on, he said, our lives have all been shaped by the world's empires in some way. Um, do you think about that in the context of your own life? Uh, that our context is set with it, I mean, do we even think of the United States as being an empire? Is, is that fair or is that unfair? I'm seeing some very sharp yeses. I, I see myself as heir to a Western intellectual and cultural tradition that I'm very thankful for. Right. But I don't. But I don't see myself as being part of the British colonial empire. Or right. Any. And you don't see uh, as one part of the cotton kingdom. Right. He suggests uh, at the top of two, I served in the Australian military and frequently worked beside military colleagues from UK and USA. Um, a little further, at the same time, Australia is now economically closer to Asia than to Europe or North America. Um, and, you know, I... <laughs> Thinking of the United States in, in as an empirical, as an empire, I think some of us hard time. It's a lot easier to think of the Roman Empire, the British Empire, one of those than to, to think of the United States as an empire. And yet, golly, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck a little bit, you know, is it a duck? Uh, Mark? I mean, yeah, so I remember being grade school learning about through college about America, our, our manifest destiny, uh, how we needed to, you know, it was a positive, it was a very positive thing. Right. We're so relieved, and we're going to make Native American lives better for all these Bible schools. And, and it was so, yeah, so in terms of how we don't have a cotton plantation now, but we've been certainly covered because of, we still deal with the race issue, yeah, you know, that was created for that impact. So I, I think it still is, is uh, impactful to think about what happened in 
where we go over to the Middle East and uh, we just say in Iraq, decide we're going to well, we make that democratic if you like us. Right. Yeah, we'll also have a nice, reliable source of oil. We don't go over there. Right. I think it still is present. Yeah. And, well, yeah. it's not exactly as obvious as the British have done. What do you think about the Mexican War and the, you know, the or the Spanish American War and the territories and possessions that America got through those uh, exercises? Yeah. And and the and the power that we exert today all around the world. Somebody wrote a book a few years ago and titled it uh, "How Do You Hide an Empire?" And one of the facts that they point out in this book is that America has something like 800 military installations around the world. 800. And, you know, it's obvious in the newspaper, you know, we're exerting power right now in the Middle East, trying to get the uh, Israelis <laughs> and Hamas to come together on a peace agreement. And so they're exerting political power. Yeah. And, and it was very different when most of us were growing up and there was tension between East and West, right? And, you know, what happens when the wall falls and sort of we won? I, I like that we, uh, he brings that up as well. Yeah, you had a question or a comment. I was just going to say, we talked about empire, that the United States is clearly an empire, but it's an empire that pretends like it isn't. You know, and the rhetoric you got growing up was like, yay, we're on the side of good, we're right, we're truth. And then if we match up against like 800 military installations around the world or, or Afghanistan, or, you know, the things that we, or the Native Americans or Black Americans. Um, and I think one thing that's causing so much uncomfort in, in like the president just say the last 20 years is like, we're starting to talk more honestly about the bad things that have really occurred because of this country. You know, both here and around the world, and trying to like own up to that, and people, some people are getting attacked. Um, but you know, clearly, clearly, we are an empire, and we're, we manipulate military power, but also like soft, soft power and the media and our influence, like socially, um, economic. Yeah. So, but yeah, of course we, of course well, we're an empire. You got to just say it. <laughs> and, and you know, talking about soft power, cultural power. Right. Exactly. I remember being a seventeen-year-old sitting in my Welsh relative's tiny little front room, watching Starsky and Hutch on their television, <laughs> thinking this is what they think the United States is like, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, Rob, you, Bob, you raise a good question though. You know, we are inheritors of this great tradition and there's so much good that has come from that. Uh, but how do we balance out sort of the, the negative side of, of that as well. And, and we're gonna have to wrestle with that a little bit. Yeah, Ken? I think part of this is finding the definition of empire. And mm -hmm. so I Googled it. And one of the first things is a strong central government. And then you could use the definition of what is uh, a central government. Is it a single figure who controls everything some of the empires have been there. I don't think America falls into that. Mm -hmm. But we worry about the separation of powers. Uh, is it still, are they still separate or are we going to get a place where the United States has not got separation of powers and then it, all the other definitions that the United States might have fall into place, a strong military, a strong economy, uh, pushing their religion or their culture on other people. Yeah, uh, a book that I would really recommend if anyone's interested in falling down this rabbit hole, written by a Yale historian, Paul Kennedy, called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. I don't know if any of you know, but it looks at sort of um, empires from the 1500s to the modern age. And it was, um, uh, came out when Japan's economy was really, really strong. And I remember the front cover, you know, has a couple of people marching across the globe with a flag and the United States was sort of marching off. And I can't remember now if it's Japan's or China's flag was marching 
sort of up the globe. Um, and of course, Japan's economy tanked uh, pretty heavily, but uh, the rise of uh, China economically uh, gets pointed up here. And I had friends from the Outreach Foundation who were saying Chinese Christian friends in country were hoping somehow that Christianity could modify the drive for kind of China's impulse uh, toward what you call state authoritarianism and uh, uh, technocratic, uh, there was a, a, a word he used here, uh, surveillance. surveillance state kind of thing. Um, and uh, uh, clearly uh, stuff is, is out on that. Um, all right. Well, I, I think it was helpful for him to start here uh, as we start to think the whole book, I think, is going to be wrestling with, you know, how do we as followers of Jesus interact with state power and seeing the context that Jesus grew up uh, under heavy imperial uh, control systems. So that's kind of where we're going uh, with this uh, a good bit. All right, over on page three, what came next in the final years of the 20th century in the first quarter of the 21st were forces of chaos and cruelty that were thought to have been vanquished forever. Um, gosh, I don't know that I felt, uh, you know, at the end of the in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s that we had won and everything was going to be rainbows and unicorns. Mm -hmm. um, the way uh, he had sort of that Francis Fukuyama, the end of history and the last man, I quote, that seems just remarkably naive uh, for anyone who has any sense of, of history. Um, but uh, you think of what's going on in Russia and the Arab Spring, climate change, mass migration, um, effects of COVID. Um, and the situation where we find, I'm over on page four, uh, the state of many Western democracies is such that they are now fraught with fragmentation to the point of being caught in legislative deadlock or committed to some morbid, self destructive feat of devouring themselves from the inside out. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm finding my view is getting a little broader that my son works for the British government, <laughs> right? And so being sensitive to what's happening there that actually has, as in, we saw in France, in the elections in France, you know, parallels to some of the kind of uh, issues that we're facing in the United States with regard uh, to the political uh, process. Um, <laughs> I did think uh, over on page four, toward the bottom, he talks about hard corruption and soft corruption, the tribalized media entities. Um, I personally am grateful that he also threw, threw in the game and gambling industry, which uh, bothers the tar out of me when I see it on television and sports events. Um, I, I think to be fair, he should. If he's going to complain about corporate uh, lobbying and political donations, he should have mentioned organized labor. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for including that. Uh, so I, I would think that it has less power than it once did. I'm sorry. I said, I, I, I think one could argue that it has less power than it once did. Because of fewer union members. Right. I, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in a steel town. And um, remember what that was like. But you read about local governments that, uh, that, that have pension plans hopelessly uh, underfunded um, because of the, the the elected officials are so in uh, in debt to the or the. the uh, Government workers union and all that keep them in office. Right. Was that your experience in Jersey? That was a yeah. 
Uh, all right. Uh, over at page six, God's kingdom in a troubled world. A people of providence, purpose, and prayer. So we're invited to think about God's providence, that God is ultimately sovereign over history. Um, I'm going to say, Guy, that is the point that Stephanie Hansen Boaz goes to when I feel my anxiety starting to like boil over and I feel so concerned. That's where I have to anchor myself again so that I can continue to be coherent and not just locked in fear. Like to me, that is an undergirding uh, faith tenet that helps me move through uncertain times. Okay. You know, I am, um, I echo that, that I, when I can feel myself as just a teeny little spot in history, that's comforting to me. And I'd be really interested to know the families of people being held hostage in Gaza or who are being bombed in Gaza feel about that. You know, it's like, it's, we're sitting in the most privileged zip code in Nashville discussing this. And so it's easy for us to say, you know, providence, providence, but, you know, I don't know if, like, if my child was being held hostage in Gaza or if I had a family who were being bombed in Gaza, if I could be, I don't know if my face there. So, I don't know, it's like, it's so much there's a bit of end. Like, for me, it is super duper comforting, and I feel like the most comfort when I look at the stars and when I feel like I'm a speck, and, you know, when I have a sense of my history when I'm right-sized and a place of awe. You know, I feel that I feel ultimately like everything's going to be okay. But then my life experience is when I'm sitting on my porch with my dogs, you know, reading this, you know, I feel like it really hasn't been tested. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's just, I don't know, there's just something to it. <laughs> you know, I go back to, as I, I did last week about enmity, I think of the hymns we sing often shape our theology in a practical way. Uh, but one of the hymns that we used to sing, I don't think we sing much anymore. God is working this purpose out as year succeeds here. God is working this purpose out, and the time is drawing near. Nearer and nearer draws the time. The time shall surely be when earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters come to sea. What was the last time we all sang that? Yeah. So, in the middle of page six, it's this statement. History is the theater of divine glory, and all history will culminate in a dramatic moment when God puts the world to rights through Jesus. Yeah. And I ask myself, do we really believe this? Is it, There is Christian hope, but how does such hope interface with history beyond a believer's personal experience? I'm hoping that's what this class can help me understand. Sure. I mean, thoughts about that? Well, sort of echoing that. I mean, later, later in this chapter, uh, he's going to cite uh, Paul in Romans 13, you know, who says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. Well, when you think about the regimes and empires that have ruled portions of this earth and are today ruling portions of this earth, for me personally, it takes a lot more faith to believe what Paul is saying here than it does to believe in the resurrection of the body. I mean, this is a real challenge to think, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I just wonder if maybe when Paul was writing to the fledgling church at Rome in the 50s AD, uh, was this more influenced by just practical considerations that, you know, you better mind your P's and Q's and follow the rules, otherwise that little church is gonna be destroyed and wipe off the face of the earth. So it's 
more, I wonder if it was more practical advice than uh, a kind of a, a core statement of faith. Yeah, what's, what's real interesting, some of you I think read with me a, a couple of years ago, uh, Howard Thurman's book, uh, Jesus and the uh, Disinherited. And uh, Thurman's grandmother had been an enslaved person and whenever her master would bring a preacher on to the place, he would always be preaching out of Paul, you know, slaves be obedient to your masters. And so she told him sort of distrust Paul. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, uh, and so I think it's, it, I don't want to drive a wedge between Paul and Jesus as people want to do. But I do think it's really interesting to think about how Paul throws down I'm a I'm a citizen of Rome card. I get out of jail at a free card. How he uses the empire at places. I appeal to the emperor, take me to Rome. He's going to hear my case. Where Jesus doesn't have that at all, right? So we see, even within the witness of Scripture, a varying way of understanding this, and I think that's really really helpful. We also know historically. The Lutherans have read that Romans 13 passage very different than the uh, Reformed churches had. And because of that, in the 30s, there was kind of this, in Germany in particular, there was this understanding of, well, we need to be obedient to the state. Uh, whereas Reformed churches historically have said, you know, we have this, we, we need to hold the state accountable to the vision of the kingdom of God. I, I said last week that Calvin puts the magistrate on the same level as the minister. Uh, but part of that is helping the community to get to the highest good through the lens of what we see revealed in the whole scripture, understanding that all of us are temporal, that God alone is uh, in charge. And, uh, you know, the history of the King James Bible, right? The King James Bible is the authorized version and when King James put it in every pulpit in England, he had a chain to the pulpit. But the reason for that is the, the Puritans over in Holland and in Switzerland are using this Geneva Bible that has marginal notes along the side. And the marginal notes, especially in the prophets, are if the king is a tyrant, it's your responsibility to overthrow him. Right? So, I, I mean, I do think, and I was going to say this a little bit later, what we find in Paul and in the rest of Scripture, I think, is this narrative that undercuts so much uh, of kind of authority. We, you know, how do we understand people different than us? Well, you look to Paul's passage, there's neither slave nor free nor Greek nor Jew you know, all of us are equal, okay? How does that deal with the outsider? You can even see in Isaiah, um, you know, in Deuteronomy, it says, if you're, um, um, uh, kind of cut off, uh, if you're a eunuch, you're outside the tent, you know, in the place, but Isaiah says, you know, even to the eunuch come in, uh, you know, so how do we, how do we read that there's a vision for liberation in the text, even if that's not necessarily this dominant mode of uh, word. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Paul is giving very explicit advice to these communities that are living under threat. But at the same time, and the book points this out, I think, well, he's also saying, wait a second, you know, there's a king above this and you're, you really belong to him. We'll get to that in that section, but thanks for pointing that out. I think you're absolutely right. Anything else? Will, you got anything yet? Well, I just would reiterate what you're saying. Paul's writing to a specific community at a specific time who's under the thumb of Roman oppression, and he's essentially protecting them by saying to obey. Uh, but he, he starts the 13th chapter saying God's the ultimate authority. So they, he, he starts the 13th chapter, the first verse is God is the ultimate authority. Then moves, well, you should you know respect the community at hand. Um, whoever is ruling. And it, and it's written to the community, not to rulers. And I think that's another important kind of a 
uh, distinction to make when reading them. But to, to get at Robert's point, this uh, history is the theater of divine glory. I always thought nature was the theater of divine glory, but uh, um, I won't quibble on that too much. Uh, but this notion of a culmination where God puts the world right through Jesus, the end of history is neither a whimper nor a bang, but creation itself transformed into new creation. I mean, don't we pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and is there a hope that that day will finally come? Um, and I think you're probably right. The question is, we say it, but do we believe it? Do we believe it in that way? Uh, I remember when I was a, a pastor in Illinois, and I was with a group of, uh, of community clergy, and we were doing an Advent study, and sort of the question came up about you know, second advent, right? O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captain Israel. That happened once, but we believe it's going to come again. And virtually none of the other pastors in the room kind of had a working belief that Jesus was going to come back. It was a little surprising to me. I mean, I, I could be fuzzy about the timetable and what that looks like, but I believe kind of this is um what the universal church has believed and professed from the beginning so but kind of right. the beginning it was like it's coming and it's coming soon and all and so for now two thousand years later right it's a little harder to uh envision that yeah exactly I th thank you Ruth. Yeah. uh that that's very true i mean paul's preaching is jesus is coming back day after tomorrow so get your life ready and then the Thessalonians are like, hey, what about my uncle Fred who just died? And uh, Jesus hasn't come back yet. So we see Paul in that earliest letter in the New Testament having a struggle to figure out what do, what do we, it's called the delay of the parousia, the delay of the second coming. How do we deal with that? What does that mean? Um, so I think you're absolutely right. Maybe the hymn we need to be singing, you know, as a you know, in contrast to the one you did, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, Bob, where you started, I think in that paragraph, history is the theater of divine glory, isn't that what you read? It's a really interesting paragraph to remember. And back to where Stephanie started, what gives you hope at the end of the day when the world just seems so, you know, yeah. History is the theater of divine glory. History has ended. History is a canvas upon which God and Jesus answers and dresses the most pressing facets of human existence. I'm just reading the paragraph on page six. Okay, third paragraph. Uh, third paragraph. What page? Page six. History is the theater of divine glory. It has an end date. It's the canvas upon which God has. Really interesting. And, and so his suggestion, the author's suggestion, is that you know God has a purpose toward all of what all of this history is moving to, right? And uh, we're we're just part of that. I, I I think one distinction he's making though is that history is unfolding in the complexity of human agency and free will, right? And the ultimate eschaton, perusia the termination of history and God's purposes is ultimately ahistorical. Because I think if we start attributing historical agents to God's final work, we're, we're just creating idols. Yeah, and there's a tension there, though, isn't it? Because the text itself is Cyrus was one of those. But, but I think the distinction is God is at work through these agents, but God is not consummating history through these agents. Fair. Good. Yeah. yeah. Because that's what happens when we have um, our, our hopes put on, on humans. And that's like Psalm 146. Do not put your, your trust in princes or in mortals. Right. right. And, and so we can see God at work in the world, but God is not consummating history except and only through Christ. Fair. Good. And, you know, in this first part here, you know, the empires are not Christian, they're pagan at all. What happens when the Roman Empire does become Christian? What happens when, and then that goes against God's vision, I guess, but even though it's supposedly, 
Christian. And I think that's what we see now. I mean, to me, what really struck out was that on page 22, where it says, Young, fine, and so on, we can see what he saw, that young and powerful, self only, looking for it, fighting for it, and the whole confusion of three years, while white progenitors like great and good parts. Substitute the United States for other power, and I think it's very apt. Um, I think we are today. What's that was, yeah. Yeah. I think another sort of element is we as human beings want to be in control. And we have to take the you know, if we could just control it, the world would be great. And you know, our democracy, we just let it really work. And the bottom line is we just aren't in control. I and mean, we're all pulling our hair out of where we are right now. And we're not ultimately in control. Unfortunately, God is. I found this latter part of this channel actually very encouraging. Uh, want to. I get back to the sentence. Yeah. Oh, maybe you can help me sometime to find what the kingdom of God is. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're going to wrestle with that a little bit. They, he, he provides a a. a uh, he does a, a little bit of uh, of that uh, here. We'll we'll take a look at that. Uh, also, so we talked about providence, purpose, and prayer. Uh, people of prayer, we have permission and indeed a command to pray. And uh, it reminded me. I can't remember if I mentioned this last week or in other Bible studies, but I was so blown away when I was reading Luther and Calvin. Uh, doing work on the Lord's Prayer. And when we come to that little petition, give us this day our daily bread, both of them say, well, you're praying for the king that there'll be peace in the land because if there's not peace in the land, then the crops can't grow. And if the crops can't grow, they can't be harvested and the carter can't take them to the miller and the miller can't make flour and the Baker can't bake bread and all of my like, wait a minute, I, I was just praying for dinner and then you're inviting me to pray for the entire political economy. I mean, how do these guys who are hanging out in the 15 and 1600s know this stuff? I mean, it was it was so expansive. And um and, and I think that that's you know, we we forget um that how the the stuff at the top affects folks, you know, at the bottom. When I was in Africa, I heard a, a proverb, when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how this affects people in their daily lives when hyperinflation hits and all those kinds of things. Um, I did think uh, on uh, sort of the bottom or the last paragraph on page seven, we believe that the church's answer to global crisis of our day and some is the kingdom of God. But I thought about, and I went back, who remembers when Machiavelli's The Prince was published? <laughs> You're old, but not that old, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I bet that was fireside reading when you were at Princeton, right? They uh, they wanted you guys to know how to do that when you have thrown it in the fire. Well, no, no. 1532. So right as the rise of the Reformation is going on, remember Luther packs the 95 theses to the Wittenberg door in 1517. Uh, this is going on, and it's not encouraging the prince how to act in a Christ-like way, but how to ruthlessly execute power, right? It's kind of interesting uh, in the midst of all of that. Uh, all right, over on page eight toward the top, Ken, how does this go? So, so, suffice it to say, the kingdom of God is about God's rescue and restoration of the entire creation as worked out in the context of Israel's covenantal history and God's action in the person and work of Jesus. In other words, God's kingdom is neither timeless and abstract ideal, nor the dissolution of the space-time universe. Rather, the kingdom of God refers to the action of the covenant God within Israel's history to restore her fortunes and bring 
to an end the bitter period of exile and to defeat through her the evil that ruled the whole world. So is this to say that because of God returned Israel from exile, uh, our future is ensured? <laughs> Thoughts? Well, that statement that you had in the book didn't help me at all. I agree. All right. I, I'm surprised to you to help you. Yes. And being so critical to the current coming of the kingdom. Right. Yeah, and, and what's really crazy about that is we, as when we came up to the year 2000, Many conservative Christians, you know, kind of latched onto that. So we had um, Texas ranchers breeding red cattle to take to Israel because there's an obscure verse in Revelation about the red cattle needing to be there. You know, all of this sort of crazy stuff. But to understand biblically this notion of um, God's kingdom be first the called people, the elect people, and, and what is Israel's original purpose to be the light unto the nation? It's through this elect people that God's glory would be known to, to all the world. And so I think that's why they're looping it back in rather than the restoration of Zion or, or something like that, okay? Uh, because, quite frankly, the history of uh, God's people, Israel, has not always been particularly favored uh, on how they have lived out that divine responsibility. And he kind of puts that up as well. So, Ken, I think that in some ways this is trying to be a... Um, Kind of a very careful definition, but not necessarily as helpful a one. Well, there, if you go to the bottom of page eight, I think this might help give it more clarity too. Um, the last sentence, not a kingdom in the sense of an earthly empire or an ephemeral spiritual state, but as a vision and vocation for faithful action that works to bring God's kingship over every facet of human life. And so the kingdom is a working out of faith uh, in the lives of, of the church and of, of Christians, but not in the sense of like an empire or some like spiritual community that excludes itself from the rest of... of I, I like that, but again, my vision may not be your vision or somebody else's vision. I, I, I mean... But but that's, that's the work of the church. Okay. So that, that's what we're doing right now. We're discerning what the kingdom is in the context of scripture and the larger tradition of the church. And that's constantly a process. There's never been a correct definition. Okay, I was going to say my definition of the kingdom of God. Well, yours is correct. Might be different. <laughs> <laughs> not. We are not to bring the kingdom of God to um, reality. We, we are to prepared for the coming of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Right? Well, then, uh, another sentence in that uh, same paragraph that, that Will uh, just cited is, is, is helpful to me. Uh, the one that begins, uh, it, was, uh, it was a way of summarizing what God had in embryonically established in Jesus. The spirit-led work that God was doing among them in the present and what God would establish in the fullness of time. So there is, you know, Jesus said, you know, the kingdom is here. The, you know, the, so the kingdom is here, but the kingdom is also happening in the present. Right. And there's an aspect of the kingdom that's in the future. We tend to so a lot of times express ourselves that the kingdom is all kind of coming of the kingdom is in the future. But Jesus said the kingdom has come, and uh, and we believe that uh, through our uh, activity, uh, it, you know, it's happening in the present. And you know, I, I don't want 
me to emphasize our activity, but really God's working in the present. And there is a future element as well. So it's not uh, a time limited thing. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Thanks. We, we talked a little bit last week about John's theology, uh, the gospel writer, which we we talk about, you know, realized eschatology. It's not just something we're waiting for out there, but it's also present right now. And the kingdom is present, but it's not present fully. And so how do we point to that? And as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, years ago in this church, and I'm trying to think if I find anybody in the room who was part of this Bible study, we had a woman in the church who desperately needed a kidney. And some folks in that Bible study came to me and said, can we, you know, put it out there? And um, we did, and a number of members <laughs> went and got tested, and one of them ended up being a match. And the next thing I know, I'm over at Vanderbilt Hospital having a prayer for this young mom who's ready to give up her kidney to this other member of the church. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think of you know, countless places where I can point to uh, deeds of mercy and justice and compassion and faithfulness and say, that's, king that's what the kingdom looks like, mm -hmm. right? That's what we're constantly uh, trying to do. Yeah. Rebecca? I was going to say, this might be a little too boo-boo, but um, my understanding of the kingdom as an individual, which is so hard to do, is when my head, my heart, and my actions are in alignment clearly with God's will. So, and that rarely happens. And it usually happens for just a split second because I can have the right idea, but not feel like doing it, and it might just be going through the motions. I could be do, trying to act my way as right thinking, and I'm not there so for me, it's to me, it's all about individually. It's about discernment, and if you know the whole world was made up of people trying to do that, the kingdom would be here. But it's like whenever my will is surrendered and aligned with God's, and I'm willing to do something about it, I'm in the presence of God, according to Richard Moore. But um, so I think. For me, I'm always trying to see things on the individual. I mean, I know this is about empire, but like, how do I? I think there's just there are so many frustrating paradoxes in the walk of faith yeah. that we have to be like fully aware. I have to be fully aware that I am broken. I'm a sinner. I need to be humble, but I can't deify living in the bubble either. Right. Yeah. And doing both of those is really, really hard, yeah. especially now. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone really gets it right. I mean, I, I don't know that any, I know that people that probably do get it right. I don't, I haven't yet figured out the formula for standing on the path to do that right. Yeah. And, and I think you're absolutely correct in the sense that uh, despair could easily become the option, right? And and so having that that timeline is really important. Many of you in this class have heard me say before, you know, these poor ladies who are in my Bible study on Thursday morning hear these stories over and over again. But, um, I heard Bishop Kuntu speak at the National Cathedral. It would have been sometime 94, 95 after he had received the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, he said, people say to him, you know, Bishop, you're courageous. And he said, I'm not courageous. Well, you must be courageous. How can you stand up to President Bota and say what you need to, you said to him? He said, I'm not courageous. I have a long memory. Where is Nero? Where is Hitler? They are the flotsam and jetsam of history, but the church of Jesus Christ goes on forever. I'll tell you, I walked out of that cathedral with my backbone a little stronger. <laughs> Wanting to bear witness, we have this history of what we know. We don't know fully, but we have a sense of what it means to follow Jesus and what that kingdom looks like, right? And the danger is, on the one hand, of saying, I can't make any difference at all, or despair. But that sense of God's purpose that gives us a long view 
we have energy to enter into the process right now, right? And we're going to pick up a little bit later on one of the one of the confessions. One of the reasons I I've kind of nerd on our creeds and confessions of the church because they're I think guideposts for the faithful over the history to say this is what it means to be living out your faith in this time in this place. Right. And it's also a reminder that, golly, and Bob, you asked this question by email last week. It's been it's been tough in you know in other times and other places. It's not just that we're the best right now. Uh, you know, back in the when we were in the the throes of the pandemic, I was reading about you know pastors in the in the play who were bearing you know two hundred members a week. Um, and are writing, you know, hymns about being faithful in the midst of that. And it's like, what do you have to complain about? Put your mask on and stay home. You know, life is a whole lot better than it was back then, right? Um, you were going to say something, Bob, and I cut you off. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, your train of thought got derailed. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm silent. Okay. Jane, I thought I had a point. I, I'm actually. I've struggled a lot with reading this, but I actually feel in our discussion here that something that I hadn't really thought much about, but the idea that the kingdom is on earth and it is also in the future, mm -hmm. um, where I think I've always just thought the future and not really here. And on the flip side, my dad, um, who was sick for 40 years, really sick. Um, used to say, our hell is on earth. And I think often we think about hell as, I don't know, hell's so very good. Is it something far off where I think it can be both? I mean, wasn't during Hitler's time our hell on earth? Had to have been. Yeah. And that's almost an easier way for me to look at it than, than not to view it that way. I think also, like, you can't have an empire with just one person. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not about just one of us. I mean, our personal relationship with Christ and with God is so important, and that is something we need to tend to always. Um, and the kingdom being here is something that happens between those of us that believe, that God brings us together and causes us to question and wonder and find the courage to step into things that we can't step into on our own. Um, and I think that being able to look back at history is what helps us in those times um, when everything just seems overwhelming. I know as a preacher, I cannot possibly write a sermon if I'm like super overwhelmed by Russian warships down in Cuba. That's a little close for comfort for me. But if I start focusing on that, there's not going to be a sermon because I'm too focused on this little spot. The sermon always preaches just a little over that. Um, scripture always speaks over that. And when we come together, we're able to live out some aspect of the kingdom in a very powerful way. And we do look back at history for that. I mean, think about um, on Sunday, the the music camp did the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and it was so wonderful. You know what? None of those people that they were representing on the stage made it to the promised land. Not even Moses. Moses got a glimpse. That's it. They didn't make it. Yet they had God's provision for them. And we can read about that in scripture and see, and Israel did get to the promised land, just not those specific people. And that's something important for us to look at, that God didn't forget about those that didn't actually get to go into the, into the promised land. God was faithful then too. And those are the kinds of stories we pick up through scripture over and over, but also in the world around us. I hope we never forget the Holocaust because that would mean we would lose people like Corey Ten Boom, who who was in the middle of it. And she spoke such a faithful message and was so faithful in doing something terrifying. I don't know if I could do that. 
But I sure hope that if I was part of a community and I was called on to do that, that we could step up or even feeling you behind me, I could step up. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that if I was in um, in Jesus' time, I never would have been a Christian because I was too much of a rule follower. But yet, somehow, I can look at the history with Jesus and the history with our people, and there's so much strength that comes when we come together. And so something about that is kingdom living as well. I think one thing you said in a minute, too, is without that individual faith, we yeah. can't come together. Right. That's why we can't be strong in individuals so, that have that individual relationships. Both together. Uh, moving on a little bit, uh, chapter 10. Christianity cannot be understood apart from empire, and the Bible is a book utterly immersed in empire. Um, I'm on page 10, uh, middle of the page. Um, they were either vassals or victims, top of 11. Yet that's not the whole story. The testimony of scripture is that kings and empires are raised up and brought down as Israel's God so pleases. It is interesting to, to read scripture through this lens, and you see, okay, first we had Pharaoh in Egypt, then we had the Syrians and the Babylonians, and then the Persian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire, and it's uh, this realization that mm -hmm. Israel's life was in the context of leadership outside themselves. Uh, over on page 12, Habakkuk um, has this vision. Um, <clears throat> there is a day of uh, recompense was coming. Yet God of the covenant, while God might use the kings for his own purposes, would never let them have all their own way. Uh, then uh, Isaiah comes along, uh, I'm over on the bottom of 13 now, the messenger declares the demise of Babylon, the liberation of enslaved Israel, summed up with two Hebrew words, Malak Elohayak, your God reigns. Uh, God brings this deliverance uh, by King Cyrus. Um, and then Daniel, um, the vision of the four beasts, representing the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Macedon, and the Seleucids. Um, and then the, the one like a son of man, this multivalent symbol who represents God's kingship. Um, and that that vision would have, the author suggests, a monumental impact on Jewish authors, the historical Jesus, the evangelists, and John of Patmos. Uh, from Isaiah, I'm at the bottom of 15 now, um, we hear that the king of Babylon might think of himself as an ascending star destined to rise above and reign beyond the celestial bodies unaware that God intends to bring him down to the pit of death to be left as a carrion for scavengers. Um, um, there's a certain arrogance of empires. I'm now over in the middle of 16. Uh, their despotic kings remind us of Shelley's poem, Osmandius. How many of you had to uh, memorize Osmandius? Uh, frankly, you know, I, I, I think I'm one of the last generations that had to or chose to memorize poetry when I was in high school. I, I was kind of an indifferent student in many subjects, but read poetry widely and uh, did exceedingly well in honor of Brett Lett because of all the poetry I was home memorizing. But uh, Osmandius has always stayed with me. And it's this, it, it is this reminder, you know, that kingdoms come and kingdoms go. And, you know, you think you're on the top of the world, but you're not. Uh, I printed it out at, uh, on your, your paper. Um, uh, Jesus, the early empire, uh, this notion that um, his whole life uh, was impacted by, um, by the empire. Over on page 18, 
that Sephorus uh, or Sephorus, depending on how you want to pronounce it, is only a few miles away from Nazareth, and uh, that this was a major important city. There are a number of scholars who suggest that the notion that Jesus was just this little carpenter was maybe wrong, that it was more like a general contractor in business over in Sephorus. Uh, I don't know that we can sustain that, but uh, I think the scholar was named Talbot. He was in Charlotte. I used to have him come and talk to my classes uh, at, at Covenant. Um, but clearly, being so close to that town um, was uh, important uh, for Jesus. Um, I liked on page 19, uh, toward the top, the paragraph starting thus, when Jesus proclaim that the time is fulfilled, God's kingdom is arriving. Uh, he wasn't offering people four spiritual laws or the road to heavenly bliss. Rather, Jesus was saying that the prophetic promise about the end of exile, a new exodus, a new covenant, a new temple, Israel's regathering and restoration were at last coming true. The kingship of God was being manifest through the things Jesus himself was doing, his own mighty deeds, healing, exorcism, and even his death. Uh, and then Paul following along, um, God's royal rescuing power executed in Jesus' mission and crucifixion and resurrection, and then the future reckoning. And that's where we get, as some of you talked about, the the both now and uh, and later. Um, uh, I liked over on 20 at the bottom. Paul's gospel, centered as it was on the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, had socio-political implications. The end of that paragraph, to declare that Jesus is Lord was to imply that Caesar is not. And then uh, toward the end of 21, Paul was not a traveling evangelist, offering people a new religious experience, but an ambassador for a king in waiting, establishing cells of people loyal to the new king and ordering their lives according to his story, his symbols and his practice, and their minds according to his truth. This could only be construed as deeply counter-imperial as subversives as the whole edifice of Roman Empire. And there is, in fact, plenty of evidence that Paul intended to be so construed that he ended up in prison as a result of his work. He took it as a sign that he had been doing his job properly. <clears throat> I think that's an accurate reading of Paul, personally. Um, some of you know the, the little book of prayer poems Gorillas of Grace. Do you know that? It, it's, it's one of my favorites. And in fact, that title has given me a vision for what I understand ministry to be. Um, that we're undermining the dominant narrative of the culture with a narrative of God's grace. And while I, you know, in my little Oxford button-down shirt, I might look like I, you know, can pass in the culture, I understand that these are in some ways camouflage fatigues <laughs> that I'm infiltrating the work of the world through a different narrative, and that narrative is of one of God's grace. Um, I used to have as my uh, in my first church a guy who was the backup quarterback for the Falcons. And uh, one day they were playing the Cowboys and uh, the lead quarterback got hurt and got out and Scotty Campbell, who was only about 5'9", played for Purdue, uh, went in and in the second half threw four interceptions. And the fold on the sports play as big letters, Campbell blows the game, right? So I run over to his house. I said, you know, how you doing? Monday morning, he said, man, I feel awful. They don't pay me enough to feel this bad. <laughs> what he said to me, let that line leave it. They don't pay me enough. To... And I started thinking, you know, most of the people in my congregation 
the, the men and women in sales, right? Are you hitting that mark? Every, you know, how do you, all of a sudden your worth as a person is based on your performance. I don't believe that. Your worth is because you are a beloved child of God. Those are different kind of narratives. How do we understand and how do we care for one another in the midst of that? All right. Um, what I'd like you to do, and we, we, I haven't answered all of Bob's or any of your questions, <laughs> and that's not my purpose today. But if you look at the sheet on Sunday, we use the following as our affirmation of faith. We believe Christ gives us and demands of us lives in pilgrimage toward God's kingdom. Like Christ, we may enjoy on our journey all that sustains life and makes it pleasant and beautiful. No more than Christ are we spared the darkness, ambiguity, and threat of life in this world. We are in the world, but not of the world. Our confidence and hope for ourselves and other people do not rest in the powers and achievements of this world, but in the coming and hidden presence of God's dead. Christ calls each of us to a life appropriate to that kingdom, to serve as he has served us, to take up our cross, risking the consequences of faithful discipleship, to walk by faith and not by sight, to hope for what we have seen, for what we have not seen. That's from uh, the old PCUS Declaration of Faith. Talk in your tables about that. How do you understand that? How do, you, how do you live that out? Is that a true thing that you can say? It's a second statement. Chew on that for a minute or two on, uh, around your tables. Will and Stephanie, are you all familiar much with this Declaration of Faith from the old East US? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As folks, I think are probably not as nervously inspired by the presentation. And that was a one that I learned at seminary. You came to learn it after seminary. But you all of it. Do they use it down at that rural coach? No, we did the Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed every Sunday. Okay. Um, occasionally we would use it, but like maybe a few times a year. Like we were very much like Apostles' Creed. How about some stuff? It's just, it's been a document that's been around for a long time. And so I have it in my list of What's interesting is um, Donovan and I, I, I think if you were to ask us, we were probably most of the four of the And when I was at, at Princeton and Dow was still kicking around, and he was kind of the primary office, which of course was written, but it means before there was any sensitivity to a first blank. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat and not get a mastering program from that. Yes. But the theology behind it. So this I was raising very a southern church version of working out that same theology, but it's much more of what's going to be known. And KC used it a lot when, we, when I first came to this. Uh, but I think uh, Donovan and I probably know so many people. I'm 
But it's a much more liturgical game. So listen, Doc is a better athlete, and uh, I think Donovan and I are deeply influenced by the theology of C68. But that was written primarily at the old year at Dow Seminary. He was the primary author of it, and it was written like for real people who were fans like Sidney. About the flu side, I know you can't stand it. That it seems like he's having a lot of things that probably do that. Um, so much so that it feels really bad. Uh, but this is a gospel, and when I came to the PC. Which means it's really free. So I got to it. But interestingly, I was like, oh, my son is flat character. And he can get voted in to be one of the 10 docents. But it's still a good guy to be really for that. And Calvin Geneva Catechism, which used to be in the Southern Church. In it, Collection of catechism, right? Confession. Let me let me call you all back. You're doing a great job talking, but um, I want to be uh, good with our time. A couple of people asked, "Where did this brief uh, declaration of faith count come from?" It was uh, out of the old Southern Presbyterian Church, the PCUS. And when the denominations reunited in 83, a book of confessions was put together, and unfortunately, it didn't get included. The one that did was that the confession of 68 covers the same theology. Um, C68 uh, is what I was saying. Donovan and I were really raised and kind of trained on C68. Um, I think that this Declaration of Faith, though, is so liturgically beautiful in a way that uh, C-68 is not. 
Um, this is kind of longer. I wonder if that's part of the reason it didn't get included. No, but, uh, it was never um, fully adopted by the PCUS. Oh, it was not? But two, two thirds, we couldn't get the majority to vote it. Okay. And Al Wynn was one of the kind of authors, and he wanted a, a statement of faith that could be used liturgically. So <laughs> it was that way. It was intentional. He wanted right. it. And, and so what happened is when the denominations came together <laughs> in 83, the new reunited church adopted a brief statement of faith, which is more liturgically uh, appropriate. But I still think that there are things in this that are so beautiful and worthwhile using uh, that Donovan and I in particular will often reach for it and use it as our affirmation of faith. Interestingly, uh, also uh, back around 2000, the denomination put together a new study catechism I ended up doing work on that, and it didn't get adopted as one of our creeds and confessions, but I'll still use it often for teaching and for study, and it's uh, really a, a very good document. That's more than you wanted to know. I also put Osmandius there so you can go home and read the whole poem, and uh, I once was a traveler in antique lands. What a great line. Yeah. Yes. Preamble yeah, well, is this affirmation here? Is that the current one that's liturgical that you're talking about? Yeah, that, that's if you, it, it's it, it ended up being kind of a long document. If you want to see the whole thing, mm -hmm. I have it here. It's really worthwhile uh, getting to know. And, uh, and and I find you know part of what's very helpful for me in my journey as a Presbyterian Christian is learning these creeds and confessions because they really are historic guideposts <laughs> along the way of trying to confess our faith in the midst of changing circumstances. So there are four that are from the Reformation period. Uh, this summer, we're gonna have the Barman Declaration. I've got two folks on faculty at Columbia Seminary doing some teaching for me uh, via Zoom about that. Um, yes. There's a uh, program that was done here uh, years ago um, and was real popular around the country uh, for a while called Festival of uh, Banners. I think. That's right. And we probably still have the banners somewhere that we made for each of the three. Right. Um, and it was a whole worship service. Oh, that second Helvetic. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> and God is working his purpose out and it's always a part at some point of this. Uh, one of those, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. So, well, thanks for engaging this text and engaging it with one another. Uh, next week, you'll be lucky to have Stephanie as your leader, and I'll try to stay at the side and keep quiet, and uh, we'll go from there. Let me send you out with a prayer. The Lord be with you. God of grace and mercy, we give thanks that we see you sovereign over history. Though we confess, O oh God, that it's hard to discern always how you're working your purpose out in the midst of it. Give us faith that we might um, bear witness as best we know how in the circumstances of our own lives as you call us to be faithful. So we seek to define your kingdom and what that means in our own time and our own place. We thank you for those who traveled before who have borne witness in their own seasons that we can take encouragement and courage from their faithfulness as we seek to be faithful in our own. We lift before you the cares on our hearts and those in our congregation who need your healing hand or hope-filled presence as they walk their journey. God is now as we go that we might share with others the grace that we so abundantly have received from you. For it's in Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lakeel and Joe and Joanna and Dana and Dan. Grace and peace, guys.